Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. This is a post episode trailer of episode 35 in which we interviewed Dr. Gopi Sundar about water birds. But let's start this episode with stocks and cranes. Uh, both are waders, both are fairly large. They have an S-shaped neck and they look similar. but stocks and cranes belong to two different orders entirely <clears throat> and how do we differentiate them well if you see a bird sitting on a tree you can be pretty much sure that it's a stock because cranes don't have a well developed hind toe which means that they can generally walk on the ground they are ground dwelling birds they uh, nest on the ground or in shallow water whereas stocks can perch and they can their their nests are usually on trees mm, similarly when the babies or the fledglings are born again there's a stark difference between stocks and cranes uh, crane fledglings or crane br- babies are precocial which Jennifer Ackerman talks about in her episode um precocial birds the way i code it in is that precocial birds are precocious they come out fairly fully formed uh, like chickens they are ready to follow their baby their parents immediately after hatching whereas altricial birds are require the altruism of parents in order to make it through by which what this means is that altricial fledglings or altricial babies require parental care for several weeks or sometimes months before they can uh, fly away so stock babies are altricial which means that stock parents have to keep bringing food to their nests which are typically on high up on trees so that's another difference so um if you see uh, uh, sarus cranes for example they will be walking around uh, the fields of uttar pradesh with their babies in tow then um There is a book that I refer to called Birds in Sanskrit Literature where it says that cranes are largely vegetarian whereas uh, stocks are um, omnivorous uh, which is not entirely true this book was written a long time ago cranes are omnivorous whereas stocks are carnivores which means that they generally eat fish insects mammals whereas cranes can get by with fish insects mammals of course but they can also get by with grains um they can eat vegetables so they can eat pretty much anything so that's another difference between stocks and cranes um what are the types of stocks and cranes found in india in india there are about two species of cranes that are resident one is the sarus crane which is the heaviest bird that flies and um the common crane um there are three that are winter migrants the siberian cranes which we talk about in our first episode on bharatpur have stopped coming to india but they used to be winter migrants into india then the other ne- the other one is the black necked crane which i have not seen but it's found in the upper Hima- in tibet and upper himalayas and the third which they we've done a whole episode about is the demoiselle cranes which are also migrants into india um stocks on the other hand um we have several species of stocks that are resident in india we have the painted stock which is common in fact right here um in karnataka where i live there is a village about 90 kilometers outside bangalore called kokre bellur which is a village where the uh, humans and the stocks the painted stocks live in harmony so we have the painted stocks uh, we have the uh adjutant stock and the lesser lesser adjutant stock that is two we have the asian open bill stock which eats which has a typically an open bill because it eats snails and it can crack open the snails much like we crack open walnuts and then um you have the black neck stock and the white neck stock dr sundar talks about the black neck stock in episode 35 where he says these black neck stocks can kill a whole duck and they take a duck and they sort of beat it and beat it till all the bones are cracked and then it swallows the stock swallows the duck whole um so these are um the stocks that are found in india 
stalks also are subject of myth and legend. Um, one Swedish legend says that the stalks flew around after Christ's crucifixion saying strika, strika, which means strength, strength. So uh, people revere these stalks. In Egypt, in an old Egyptian wall plate, there is a uh, there is an image of a stalk that is used by a farmer to till the land. So these are viewed again as strong birds, and of course the common English saying is that uh, is about the stalk brought brought the baby home. Um, if you look at it, this originated in Europe, and the stalks leave um, Europe in late summer and about nine months later they return and so this is so again the nine months um, summer is when fertility increases because it's warm so this is the reason the outgoing and the incoming of stalks when the baby was born sort of made parents tell their um, young children the stalk brought the baby home in india cranes um, and actually in much of Asia, including Japan, um, for example, in China, um, cranes are revered and are the subject of a lot of uh, mythology. In Manusmriti, which is a Sanskrit text about codes of life, um, somebody who steals a woven textile, which India is famous for, uh, is cursed to be born as a common crane in his or her next birth. And the logic is that the common crane's tail feathers looks like the woven Indian, the Indian weaves or the threads of an Indian weave. Um, the Sarus crane is, of course, uh, the subject of one of India's most ancient epics, the Ramayana. Uh, the opening chap, opening verse of Aranya Parva says that Valmiki, the author of the Ramayana, was passing by the forest when two Sarus cranes were engaged in lovemaking and a hunter shot one of these birds and killed it and the other one watching the other one pine for its lost loved one made Valmiki so angry that verse emerged from him and that was the first verse of the Ramayana which basically cursed the hunter and said oh hunter you who have killed the Sarus crane and so on um, of course um, in Sanskrit, every lots of things have double meanings. So the first word is often said that it's also a curse to a hunter, but at the same time, it is a uh, revered verse about Lord Vishnu and Lakshmi. So there you have it. Um, but this is it's not just Sanskrit literature where this crane or the crown cha is revered. Um, Emperor, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir also, there's a story that he watched how a Saru's crane pined for its dead one to the point where it stopped eating, it stayed in position right next to its dead mate. And when it eventually died because it wouldn't eat or drink, they lifted up the body, the entire breast of the second, the mate, the uh, second crane was eaten with maggots and ants. So even the Mughals were very familiar with this um, you know, the pair bonding of the Saru's crane. But that is literature. In episode 35, Dr. Sundar talks about how uh, certain cranes can uh, engage in what he calls hanky-panky. And it has been observed that there is a trio of cranes um, which uh, where a third crane uh, besides the pair is sort of en uh, enlisted as a nanny to take care of the, of the young ones. So it's somewhat, I mean, it isn't exactly similar, but it brought to mind uh, an episode where, that we did with the land-stailed mannequins where the courtship happens between the alpha bird and the beta bird. So, but this is not the alpha and the beta males. It is two uh, mates and a third sort of a nanny <laughs> or somebody who helps with the fledglings. So there's that. But the bulk of the episode actually uh, paints a fantastic picture, a hopeful picture about coexistence between cranes and humans in India, specifically in Uttar Pradesh, um, where the farmlands um, are uh, host Sarus cranes. 
Um, the word Sarus actually comes from the Sanskrit word Sarasa, which means lake bird. Um, so these cranes wade around the, vil the villages. They are very aggressive when they, once they nest and once they lay their eggs, they hold their stands. And then there's all this body language that a crane puts out to defend its uh, uh, fledglings and its nest. But the most beautiful thing about the cranes, of course, is the duetting or the unison call where both of them um, trumpet at the same time. Oh, and that's another difference between cranes and storks. Cranes have a loud trumpeting call and it's very distinctive. Either you can hear it in the Demoiselle Crane episode, um, but storks lose their syrinx or their voice box pretty much after infancy. And so storks cannot call or make sounds. The way they engage uh, in courtship rituals is by clacking their beaks together and then spreading their wings and engaging in some sort of a dance. So cranes and storks both have this amazing courtship behaviors. Dr. Sundar talks about the courtship of the Sarus crane where he stood for about 45 minutes and watched these cranes leap up in the air, spread open their wings, call to each other, twist their, uh, you know, their necks, all in this elaborate courtship ritual that looks like one of those medieval European dance balls, you know, where they're all bowing and bending and, and twisting and shaking and things like that. Um, the episode is hopeful because it overturns all common wisdom because common wisdom says that when humans take over a landscape, the birds have to go, but it's the opposite where Sarus cranes have thrived in the farming landscapes. The second um, uh, common wisdom that is overturned is that farmers with large land holdings will give up a portion of their land to um, wildlife. Here in Uttar Pradesh, the, the farmers generally have very small uh, farms, half an acre, half a hectare, but still they give up portions or, or they, they allow the Sarus cranes to thrive alongside with them. Um, so these are some of the things that Dr. Sundar talks about in episode 35. I, um, I would urge you to go back and listen to it to understand a little about these magnificent waders that are deep, they are an ancient clade, as he says, which means that they probably be, they probably evolved before um, India separated from Africa. Um, they are about 150 million years old and have existed in um, India since then, or in, 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 existed in the world since then. So this is an ancient bird, which is probably why it is the source and a, character, and a character in much of world mythology. So please go back and listen to episode 35. This is just a summary. Bird Podcast is produced by Ullas Anand and Echo Edu. I'm Shobha Narayan. Thank you for watching and listening.